Welcome everyone to the Liverpool.com podcast. I'm your host David Comerford and I'm joined once again in our Liverpool City Centre studio by the Liverpool.com editor Matt Addison and in today's episode we're going to take a deep dive on Alexis McAllister who was signed in the summer for about £35 million from Brighton and like Dominic Soboslai he started every Premier League game for Liverpool since he arrived but it's probably fair to say it's been a little bit more of a mixed bag for him for various reasons. So Matt, just to kick us off on this one, I'll ask you a pretty straightforward question. How would you rate McAllister's start to life at Anfield out of 10? Well, you say a straightforward question. I had a little look at the agenda last night and I was trying to come up with, with a number. I think it's, it's, so hard to, it's so hard to judge in terms of you know, how good he is in terms of his start because he's not playing in his position as we'll come to. Um, he, he struggled a little bit at times. I think he's looked good in other games as well. So Look, it's it's been a mixed bag. He'd probably maybe go for for a six or a seven, maybe if you're being generous. Mm. Um, but it's it's one of those where I'm judging him, but I don't really want to judge him just yet because we know that he's not really doing the job that he was asked to do when he was brought in. So if we're talking about a score and you're saying sort of six or seven, I mean, to what extent are you kind of factoring in the fact that he's not in his his you know favorite position? Because you could say. In the circumstances, maybe it's been a seven, but sort of overall, it's maybe closer to a five in terms of his actual performance levels. I mean, he is a number eight. He's being asked to play as a number six. I mean, how much is that colour in your perception of him at the moment? Yeah, I mean, that 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 is how I'm going to judge him because he's much better further forward. We knew that that was what he expected when he came in. Mm. I think you've got to take that into account for sure um, in terms of his actual performances as a number six. As we'll come to, the, the other option is Wataro Endo. I'm not massively convinced on what we've seen of him. Mm. I still think McAllister, even though he's not great in this position, is better as an option. I also think he's better than Fabinho was for much of last season, probably the whole of, of last mm. season. Um, you know, th- There's one or two issues with McAllister in that position, but I don't think it's anything new for Liverpool in terms of that role. I think Fabinho for the majority of last season didn't look particularly quick on the turn, wasn't necessarily in the perfect positions was maybe throwing himself into tackles and getting yellow cards mm. when he didn't need to. So those are the issues. I, I still think Liverpool have improved on what they had last season. It's just not what we thought they were going to be when you know, they made a, a British record bid for Moises Caicedo. Mm. They've been in for Germany in the past. They clearly want someone who is elite in that, level, uh, in that position. He isn't ever going to be at that level because it's not his role. But um, I think you can, you can kind of only do what you can do. If, if you're him, that's the, the role that he's going to play. There's probably an argument that it's worked out all right for him because I don't necessarily think he'd be getting in the team ahead mm. of Curtis Jones and, and Dominic Sabozlai. So it, it, it's a hard one. But I think if you asked him, he'd probably just say, maybe let's, let's judge me in a few months when there's somebody else who can play there and, and, and he can play a little bit further forward. Yeah, we'll definitely revisit that question about Curtis Jones a little bit later on. And I mean, the whole sort of context of this podcast, I suppose, is we're talking, you know, eight games into the Premier League season, a few games in cup competitions, you know, where it's still very early to be judging a new sign. But I think with Carlos is still, you know, a particularly intriguing case because of this sort of positional discussion that's going on. And I think you make quite an important point as well about Fabinho because... McAllister, I believe, came in sort of mid-June, I think it was. He was very early through the door. And at that point, Fabinho was not only at Liverpool, but we thought he was going to stay. You know, we thought the club's sort of policy was, let's give him another chance. Then this bid comes in from al Etihad of about £40 million. And they go, well, we've got to take that. You know, he's 29 years old. He's, we're not 100% sure about him anymore. Um, and that kind of changes things around. So I think he's come in expecting to play as a number eight. Jürgen Klopp's probably expecting him to play as a number eight. Um, and Lincoln into that before the game against Brighton last weekend Klopp said that he took a guess that that McAllister could play the role um, so he, he kind of had to look for a solution I mean you mentioned Caicedo there I wonder what kind of conversation we're having now if he was playing alongside Caicedo because he's got that obviously established dynamic there and um, that's obviously a, an alternative sort of version of history at this point but so Klopp said he, he guessed that McAllister could do the role that's where he sort of slotted him into the team and he also said that if we as a team defend well, he can definitely play the six. Would you agree with that? And is that why you think, based on your first answer anyway, that he is a viable solution in that number six role? Yeah, so I, I think we saw this perfectly against Aston Villa, where that was a team where we expected Liverpool would probably have to struggle a bit more than what they did. We thought they'd maybe probably have a little bit less of the ball than what they ended up having. But that was a perfect example, really, of you almost make it so dominant that you don't have to do the defending you don't lose the ball as 
they did at the weekend with Van Dijk trying to pass it to him and you know Brighton nick in and, and get it. If you are in complete control, he's a perfect option to play there because we know how good he is on the ball, how you know his ability to dictate things and, and to progress the ball is, is really impressive. He's got two players in front of him that are perfect for that as well. So I think against the vast majority of Premier League teams, home and away, you can play him and it's absolutely fine. The difference comes when it's Brighton away or it's Man City away or whatever it might be. One of the, the better sides, Arsenal, probably to some extent a, a Manchester United, depending on how they play. You know, there's very few sides, I think, where this doesn't work. So for mm. the majority of the games, and let's not forget the majority of the games last season that Liverpool dropped points in, did tend to be against the lesser opponents. Yeah. So I, I think for... For 75, 80%, maybe even a little bit more of this season. McAllister in the six works perfectly. It works as it has against, you know, an Aston Villa when Liverpool are, are at the best, everyone's up to speed. Mm. You know, we have to remember that the Villa game was was really good, but it, you know, it's it's early in the season. There's still players getting used to how each other play. To see that at that point, I think, is is probably a sign of, of what it can be in the future. But mm. I think that's how it has to be if you're gonna play him there. The difference and, and why Liverpool wanted Caicedo, I think, is more the bigger games that might decide a title. You know, you, you can beat the bottom 14 home and away mm. and get into the top four, but it's that next step then to, to go yeah. on and, and challenge Manchester City and, let's be honest, probably get close to 100 points to, to win the league. That's the difference, I think, between McAllister takes you yeah. a level up on what it was last season, but he maybe doesn't take you the next level to go and, and win the league. Yeah, and I suppose that is the crux of it. You know, he has had good games so far, but is it a viable solution over a full season? I would sort of be a little bit, you know, cooler on him playing the position generally than you, I think, Matt, because there's just a few things that I've sort of seen in these first sort of eight Premier League games that look a little bit sort of off to me. And I think one of them is um, the amount of fouls that McAllis is making. So, you know, you mentioned Fabinho earlier, one similarity between the two players that they're right up there in the Premier League for, for total fouls. So um, I think McAllister has made 16 so far and only four players in the Premier League have made more. And he's also only two um, yellow cards away from a suspension and he's got 11 games to get through without that. And to me, I'm looking at that and saying, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is that he's not necessarily you know, proactive in diffusing danger. So he's having to react and that often means just bringing someone down. I think maybe there's questions about the physicality there as well in terms of when sort of midfielders are running at him, does he have kind of the speed and, and the strength that he needs to stop them fairly? And, and maybe just something as simple as the timing of a tackle as well, which something Fabinho in his prime was certainly very good at. I'm not sure McAllis has that to the same extent, and I'm not criticising him for that because he, you know, has specialised in this number eight position and the, they're all kind of number six skills, basically. So we didn't expect to have to be tapping into, you know, those um, attributes, I suppose. And I just don't think that he's fully got the awareness of danger that you need and I, I remember and, and it does kind of feed into your point Matt about, about it being one of the better teams but on the first game of the season against Chelsea there was a couple of instances where McAllister was sort of watching the ball and there were people running off his shoulder and alarm bells were probably ringing at that point just to think to yourself hang on does he actually have sort of the awareness that he needs to play the position and you know I think another thing that, that Klopp said was that sort of you know defending as a team um it's fine. He does have Sabas, Lyon, Jones in front of him. It's just, to be fair, I've got to a phenomenal amount of work so far um, in front of him, which they didn't really have last season. With um, I mean, if you think back to the game against Brighton, I think the midfield last year was Fabinho, Henderson, Oxley, Chamberlain, and Thiago. So if you're Fabinho at the base of that midfield, you know you're gulping before that game, basically saying you know that those players in front of you, I suppose. But it's different now. But I just think in any game, and you can probably point to an example in each match so far, there's going to be situations where the number six needs to be like a firefighter basically and granted Liverpool's record is good with McAllister and maybe that kind of counteracts what I'm saying in the sense that they can manage without it but it just feels like you know you mentioned being able to hoover up the points against the weaker teams and maybe struggling more against the top sides I just worry that there's going to be certain games with McAllister you know as that six where Liverpool are course out and not through his sort of own fault really just because he doesn't have that those instincts that maybe yeah. a Fabinho would have done. That only works when Liverpool play well. If Liverpool don't play well and it's a weaker side, you can still get punished. I think mm. there's there's enough quality even at, at the bottom of, of the league where there might be an odd game, you know, 
a few years ago, it would have been you know a classic Zaha for, for Palace or something like that. It would it would be a case of, of targeting certain areas, and, and maybe teams will look at, at that and think that that's an area that you can get at Liverpool. But I think in the majority of games, it'll probably be be okay. But mm. let me be clear, I'd much rather have you know a, yeah. a Moises Caicedo type player in that position because mm. it. A is an upgrade, but B allows him to, to play in his better role as well. So it's um, it, it's a bit of a stopgap. It's a bit of yeah. a, he can do it, but we know that there's an alternative. And I'd be surprised if in the next sort of year or so, Liverpool didn't go out and, and get a proper, mm. you know, ha- having put the money on the table and been prepared to, to do it for other players as well. I think, you know, it, it's got to be, along with centre-back, the next priority, I think, in terms of what Liverpool go and get. And just to go slightly off piece here for a second, I mean... If you look at Manchester City, Rodri's obviously just been suspended. They lost all three games. I think it's the first time they lost back-to-back Prem games for five years. Yeah. And people said before the injury that Rodri was the most important player. And I think now that, that's pretty much been confirmed by what we've seen. Um, and you mentioned sort of it being a, an important task for next year as well in the transfer market. I mean, part of me thought we see so many evolutions in the Premier League, especially in recent years. It feels like the game has really come on a lot. You know. Guardiola and Klopp mostly maybe a little bit of Arteta now and things like that where the role of different players changes you mean you know you look at how full backs are now expected to play like wingers for example um, and things like that so you, I thought to myself maybe there's a scenario where hang on you actually do start playing with a number six like McAllister maybe that is going to be a, a new way forward type thing where it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a pure destroyer maybe more teams will move towards that kind of just you know that ball player if you like but looking at what's happened with Rodri is there an argument that you know a number six who's sort of complete, who can do the gritty defensive side, but also kind of progress the ball really well, is that potentially the most important position of all of them really within the modern game? Because I think you can make the case that obviously every single position is significant, but that one feels like it's got sort of another dimension to it. Yeah, I think you can definitely make the argument. I think it's it's probably the most important because it's the most difficult. And mm. I think there's there's probably two or three positions across the pitch where Liverpool ask one player to basically do the job of two so Trent would be one Mm. in terms of moving inside and then the right sided centre back has to do a bit of right back as well Mm. as a result but I think the the number six is is one as well where you know 10-15 years ago we would have seen always two players in front of the back four Mm. what Rodri can do what Fabinho did at his best is basically just do that in one I think Declan Rice will will end up doing that for Arsenal Um, that that's the level of, of player that we're talking about and I think it's easy to criticise Liverpool for not having a plan but they, they weren't expecting to lose Fabinho and Henderson they did try and get Caicedo there's probably no one else that realistically is of that level that they could have gone and got you know I, I can't think of a name Chiumeni obviously chose mm. Real Madrid a year later is, is still there and you know how long for potentially could be the next 10 years he might decide mm. to move and, and maybe he becomes uh, an option again but I don't think it, there's there, there's not another Rodri on the market that you can go and get so then it's a case of, of finding different solutions I'm glad they, they got Endo in terms of getting someone in but I'm not convinced that he's going to mm. be a regular Premier League player he's not going to be someone who, who comes in for these big games I think there's maybe an argument that you maybe put him and McAllister together and you make them do it as a two because mm. maybe between them they've got the skills to do that but then obviously you lose a player a little bit further forward it changes the way that you play so there's no obvious solution until Liverpool can identify someone who is at the very elite level mm. on the transfer market then I'm not quite sure what the solution is other than to just go with McAllister because I think he's, he's maybe the best option they've got but it's definitely important to sort it out mm. it's just you know it's easy to to look at that and go, well, there's, there's an obvious gap there. We know that because they've bid you know, an unprecedented amount for Caicedo. Who is it that they go and get? I'm, I'm not too sure. Yeah, and I think we'll, we'll come on to maybe that possible combination with Endo in a second. And uh, You reminded me of a line, I think David Lynch reported it during the summer. He said that Liverpool sources were basically pointing out when they were briefing journalists that in their eyes there was a lack of um, pre-peak, you know, top quality number sixes on the market. And obviously, the two outstanding ones are Rice and Caicedo. They went for Caicedo, didn't get him. Maybe went a little bit late there in terms of putting the groundwork in. Rice, obviously, yeah. was always kind of Arsenal v Man City for him. You know, Arsenal were the favourites, obviously, from the outset on that one. Um, 
And then, to be fair, there are sort of quite a few towards the other end of the scale who maybe Liverpool could have gone with would have been a bit imperfect. And then, I suppose the question you, you ask as a fan then is, was there anyone in the middle who would have kind of been a suitable option with Liverpool allowing perfect to be the enemy of good again type thing? And maybe that is more so a discussion for the end of the season. Jake DeCorey, for example. Yeah, I, I, again, like he, he is probably a solid player, but, you know, 70 million, for yeah. example. Like, is that the kind of deal that, like, you know, proves Liverpool's points in a way? Because... You know, it would have been an all right solution, but for that price tag, I mean, obviously, Rice and Caicedo inflated the markers, I guess. But um, just to bring it back to McAllister more specifically, then all the weaknesses I talked about previously were sort of, you know, off the ball, which you'd expect most of all. Um, for a number eight transitioning back into that number six position, but have you been a little bit maybe underwhelmed by what you've seen from him in possession as well? Because for me personally, I thought that was his biggest strength, but I think there's been. You know, some good moments, obviously, but also maybe a few uncharacteristic mistakes on that side of the wall. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I wonder whether that's just because of, of, of his positioning. Mm. I think if you have him a little bit further up the pitch and he's the one making the pass that Sabozlai or, or Curtis Jones may be playing into the front three, mm. maybe we see a little bit more from, from that side of it. I, I know what you mean, though. I think he, he's the kind of player that is a little bit like a Thiago that you'd expect would be able to to just drop into any of the midfield positions and, and be able to progress it. Maybe we haven't quite seen that yet, but mm-hmm. I don't know, it's it's still early, I think, to, to be judging that. And again, I'd I'd make the same point of, you know, it's it's not his position, it's not something he's used to. I know he's done it a little bit for Brighton, but that was more of a, a two with him and Caicedo. So mm-hmm. uh, maybe he's just getting used to, to the way that Liverpool play. Um, and to be fair, so is, is Sabozla in front of him. Um, obviously, Curtis Jones knows exactly how to play it, but I think there's there's definitely an argument that the more that they play together, the more of, of that we'll see. But th- there's more to come, I think, from him. Mm. But it's it's not something that's stood out as, as being worrying. I'm, I'm far more worried about runners off him, not yeah. being able to sort of be, be quick on the turn, things like that. I think the on-ball stuff, I think, eventually will just take care of itself. Yeah, and I think just, just from watching him, there's just been a few moments where it's just been sloppy, really, just in terms of, you know, sometimes to be passes going out of play, giving the ball away, things like that. Um, and again, I, I agree with you, Matt, that's probably going to be something that he irons out in time. I think you make a decent point as well in terms of it's a different kind of pass he's having to play. You know, yeah. when he's in that number eight position, it was maybe more kind of the short forward passes or the little combinations and things like that, which are maybe more his game than kind of launching the attack by playing a pass through midfield for example it's maybe a little bit more instinctive as well when mm. you're in those areas i think when you kind of you've got a few more seconds when you take the ball off a center back or, or something yeah. like that i mean i don't know i mean he'd be he'd be able to explain it far better than i would mm. in terms of, of being in those positions but to me that that maybe feels a little bit different as well if if you've just kind of got one touch and then you play it to the front three that's a very different skill i think to you know, a Trent type player where you put your foot on the ball, you're looking and, and then you're pinging a, a 50 yard ball or you're, you're making the right choice. I think mm. it's, it, it might only be 20 yards different on the pitch, but it is a very different pass that you are trying to play. Yeah, because you're facing sort of uh, an opposition in a completely different phase and, and a different sort of area of the pitch. So it, it does make a difference that. And um, I think if he does continue in the deep role, it's something that he's going to have to adjust to. And we'll see, obviously, if he moves forward. But I do wonder as well if, you know, in addition to the kind of tactical side, if there was a tiny bit of a lack of confidence from him or or maybe just kind of adjusting to the spotlight to playing for a team like Liverpool, just in terms of making maybe one or two. I mean, we're not talking about a huge amount of, of bad passes here, but I think I, when I looked earlier in the season, and he has improved in this regard, but when I looked earlier in the season, I think he was bottom of Liverpool's regular midfielders for passing accuracy um, and that's not the kind of thing you'd expect but I suppose you know sometimes it can be a, a confidence issue as well yeah. in terms of the way he's playing. Um, the reason we're, we're kind of doing this podcast is because McAllister struggled against Brighton at the weekend I think most people would, would accept that um, but we shouldn't just because of that overlook the positive side of things as well and if we're going to make this a balanced episode we will have to look at kind of the things that have been Good so far. So, so what have been the main sources of encouragement that you've seen in these first couple of months of McAllister? I mean, it, it, it's hard to, to, to bring up anything new that we've not talked about in terms of, of the negatives and trying to, to counter those things. I think there's definitely a really good player there. There's a really intelligent footballer. He's not the quickest, but I don't think that particularly matters. He's not the most physical, but he's a different kind of, of midfielder. We, we can't compare him to a Wijnaldum or a Henderson. Liverpool's midfield is just different now. Um, I, I just I like what I've seen in terms of, of the glimpses of, of what we, we could see from him, but 
I don't think I'll ever be you know, 100% excited about him until we see him a little bit further forward. Um, you know, you, you look at the options Liverpool have got there. We've not mentioned Gravenberg, but you've got him, Soboslai, Jones, McAllister. If Liverpool can get a proper player to sit in behind those, mm. you know, whatever combination of, of those players, I mean, what a midfield that's going to be. I, I think, as I said before, but for three quarters or more of, of this season, Jones, McAllister, Soboslai, that's a, a, a fine midfield. That, yeah. that, will, that works. It, it will get them to a certain level, but... You know, if, if you can have somebody to come in and play as the six, and then you can rotate Jones and McAllister, Sabosley and Gravenberg. I mean, that, that that that's a midfield that is is set up to to be exactly what Liverpool are looking for for, for the next ten years. So, uh, what am I excited about so far? Is is almost the future? Yeah, a, yeah. a completely different role, a completely different position for him. I've seen enough, not obviously just for for Liverpool, but for Brighton as well. What we mm. saw at the World Cup. There's clearly a, a brilliant footballer in there, but I just think he, he needs to be allowed to take that next step by playing a slightly different role. Yeah. And I just think the only way that you do that is to, to bring somebody in to play the position that he's having to fill in right now, unless Stefan Bajetic can get to that level. Mm. Um, but I don't want to put too much pressure on him. He's still very young. Coming back from the injury, yeah. it, it might be another you know couple of years before he gets over the injury and gets back to, to the form. It, it's not something that you can kind of mm. hang your hat on and... and even if he was back at 100% fitness, I wouldn't want to play him every week anyway. I think yeah. you've still got to be really careful with him. So for me, the answer is the transfer market, which I'm sure a lot of our, our <laughs> listeners will be, will be delighted about. Yeah, and I think I was you know, also really excited when he arrived. I mean, especially for the price target. Yeah. It, it looked a lot like I had signed in of the summer potential. And um, I think, you know, as much as so far it's been a mixed bag, like I said, right at the top, I don't have any concerns about this signing going forward, especially because I do think that if it doesn't work as a number six, he will just be moved forward. Like it's not like he's locked into this position definitely. And another player I mentioned right at the start, I mean Sobosly, in a way you maybe do feel for McAllister because Sobosly has probably been one of the fastest starting players we've seen Klopp sign. You could you could argue. And obviously to be play you know, he's also been in the team a lot, so he's kind of compared directly to him. Maybe McAllister, it's actually a little bit natural to start like this. I mean, we've seen, remember when Fabinho came in, he wasn't yeah. even starting games yeah. until about October or something like that. It's so a lot, lot easier to stand out as sub rather than McAllister. Yeah. I think McAllister, every mistake is going to be magnified where you know, sub can lash one over the top from 40 mm. yards and, and everyone just goes, oh, he's, he's good at shooting, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. um, there's still there's still improvements from him. He, obviously, both of, of the starts have been very different. Uh, obviously, Sabosla has, has been better so far. But I think if if McAllister had played the same position as as him, maybe we'd be you know having a, a slightly different conversation about him as well. Yeah, definitely. And um, just to tie it up with some more kind of positive things, I think there's been two standout moments of pro- of real quality from McAllister. I think there was the first game of the season against Chelsea where he launches the pass down the wing for Salah. Salah crosses it in uh, for Diaz and Liverpool scores so that you know it's a pre-assist in his first game, brilliant pass. And then he gets his actual first assist for Darwin Nunez against West Ham with, with a brilliant sort of chipped ball from midfield. So those are the kind of glimpses that you really want to look at, I think, in terms of being optimistic about the future. Um, and then, you know, something a bit more subtle. I think he, um, Andrew Beasley from Liverpool.com um, pointed this out on Twitter the other day. He made more interceptions against Brighton than any Liverpool player had in a Premier League game since Fabinho against Leicester in February 2022. So you're going back like about 60 games ish there, um, and that to me shows that not so much kind of breaking things up in his own half, but knowing where to position himself to sustain that Liverpool high press. Really, I think is the important thing there, and the best example of that is when Dunk I think cleared it from sort of you know the bottom left hand corner of the pitch, and McAllister was there to intercept it. He plays it onto Sobosly, and then Liverpool kind of have a goal-scoring attack off that. I think it's Salah's equaliser in the game, um, and yeah, he's, he's up there in the Premier League for interceptions as well. So I think that's one area where you could say his reading of the game has been quite strong and his tactical understanding and things like that. So it's, he's a lot more proactive than what Fabinho was last season. You know, we we, we kind of think of Fabinho as peak Fabinho, mm. but that was that was a long time ago now. Um, so yeah, he's he's not perfect, McAllister, but he's. I think he's a level up on what Liverpool had in that position last season, even if it's not you know, the, the level that you probably want long term. Yeah, I mean, if you're comparing him to a 
sort of 2019 Fabinho he's always going to struggle yeah. to, to live up to that standard definitely but um, certainly it's interesting to think what Fabinho would have been like within this midfield would it have been the player who's in the Saudi Pro League walking around yeah. or would it have been a player who's kind of revitalised by having that you know improved protection in front of him both in terms of energy levels and also you know the structure being a little bit better as well but um, last couple of sort of discussion points then Matt I mean a lot of fans on social media are calling for Klopp to bring in Wataru Endo now and um, obviously the, the very next game is against Everton and interestingly McAllister is going to be returning late again from yeah. um, international duty and last time it didn't go very well when Klopp tried to use him from the off against Wolves so do you think it is time now to give Endo a chance and just touching on what you said earlier could the template going forward to be sort of Endo and McAllister as a midfield too? Because obviously if you do that, then you've got to bring out one of the players in front of him who have been quite impressive so far. Yeah. Um, well, firstly on Endo, I, I, I'm i not sure that he is ever going to be a, a Premier League player for Liverpool regularly. That's not to sort of downplay him in terms of his ability and you know, what, what he can offer Liverpool. I think there's been a lot of excitement based on what we've seen in the Europa League and, you know, for probably half a game against Leicester, mm. who are Leicester, but they are a championship side. That they're not, you know, they're not a great team in terms of, of needing to, you know, take it take it up a level, essentially. Um, I'd be worried about him. I, I, I wouldn't have, have started him. I think it was probably telling that Jurgen Klopp didn't even bring him on against Brighton, even though McAllister was struggling. He didn't turn to him. Um, I've got concerns about his mobility. I think we saw that pretty much straight away when he came on. He was... You know, shuttling about the pitch, but not particularly, you know, quick or, um, you know, he's he, he's not particularly good on the turn. I don't think mm. he's he's a player that has has got certain qualities that you'd want from that position, but I don't think he he can really hold things together on his own. He's certainly not as good on the ball as what McAllister is. He can get himself into defensive positions, but even then, I mean, <laughs> there's been three or four times where Jurgen Klopp's been screaming at him because he's just gone for a run up the pitch and has found himself on the edge of the box and then he can't get back quick enough. Mm. So, you know, if if you're doing that against Leicester in the Carabao Cup, it's one thing. If you're doing that, you know, against Brighton or, you know, whoever it might be in the Premier League, I think there might be a bit more of an exposure of a few weaknesses that he's got. There's a reason that he's played for Stuttgart for as long as he has. There's a reason that Liverpool have not looked to buy him before, despite the need for a midfielder. Yeah. He's he's not the perfect option. I think he's more of a, a Milner-type option, where you bring him in a little bit. You might bring him yeah. off the bench for 10 minutes. You might use him in the Cups. You might use him in the in the uh, the Europa League at, at certain points. But I, I don't see him being a solution in the Premier League. The only way that he could potentially be is if you play him in a two. Yeah. Um, Look, I've not seen him for Stuttgart. I'd never heard of him when Liverpool signed him, but I assume that they probably played in a two. Um, he probably wasn't being asked to do what you know, Peak Fabinho or Rodri can do and, and do that role on on their own. And again, that's no slight on him because clearly McAllister can't do it to that level either. So, you know, he's he's not as good a footballer, so you wouldn't expect that. Mm. But maybe, maybe there's a, a solution where you play the two of them together. But then it's you know who do you take out of the team in front? I, I wouldn't really want to to bring Endo in to do that mm. at the expense of, of Curtis Jones or Sabah's I, I I don't really see that as as being a solution. You've also got loads of other options who can play there. You then have two out of Jones, Sabah's and, and Gravenberg on the bench, which it doesn't feel the best balance or the best use of the squad to have more of those attacking options on the bench than yeah. than on the pitch. Um, so there's, there's there's no obvious solution. Um, the the one thing I would say is that I I don't think it's I don't think it's one where he just swaps out McAllister for Endo. I don't think that solves it. Um, I, I'm just not quite convinced yet. I still think McAllister is, you know, the the best option that Liverpool have got. Even though he's not perfect, it might just be what they have to go with for now. Yeah, and the thing that surprises me with Endo is, you know, he started against Newcastle, which was about a week after he came in. And I wonder if Klopp, obviously that game was a bit strange, but I wonder if Klopp almost took a look at him there and thought, hang on, maybe he needs a bit more yeah. time. Yeah. But for him to have played one of the seven, from, certainly from the start, one of the seven Premier League games which he's been available is a surprise to me. And, and even though he is you know, a player who doesn't have that much pedigree at club level um, and came in for a relatively low price tag and he's 30, things like that, 
I did think he was going to be used more just because I mean if you look at some of the things Klopp said about him in the summer he said have a look because he's a really good player kind of give him a chance type thing um, he was always on my list we just don't usually sign players from this age group and um, he will show how good he is on the pitch and this was the kind of message of you might not be inspired by the sign and but watch you know when he plays you're actually going to be quite yeah. quite impressed by him I wonder whether that was more a we've just missed out on Moises Caicedo mm. and Romeo Lavia we've got this lad so you're going to have to just sort of put up with it type thing yeah um, maybe that's me being a little bit cynical but I, I wonder to what extent mm. really he was you know he's never been one that's been listed as someone that Liverpool have looked at before mm. and Jurgen Klopp's been at Liverpool long enough that he could have signed a 25 26 year old endo but he chose not to mm. so I, I don't know whether I, I buy that necessarily but I, I know where you're coming from. He, he's clearly yeah. he's clearly a good enough player to be a squad player for Liverpool, but I just don't think he's the the solution that they're looking for at the moment. I take your points on that definitely. I just think that because it was such a you know it was a Klopp signing, basically, part of me thought he was going to kind of just throw him in a little bit more, um, especially in light of obviously what we've seen with maybe the the balance not being quite right. And on the point about balance, I mean. There was um, somebody on Twitter, uh, Dan Kenneth, made, made the point um, after the game against Brighton, likening it to the situation with the centre-backs in the 2021 season, when Klopp basically admitted that he should have played Williams and Phillips earlier because even though they were obviously limited as players, yeah. it meant that basically the identity of the team could be restored, the midfielders could actually play in midfield. Um, and when they came into at the team at the end of the season, Liverpool, I think we had sort of maybe one of the best runs of form of anybody in the league even with all the injuries they had so kind of obviously Endo is a much better player than those two but on a similar theme is there an argument that Endo might actually be of the whole midfield group he might be sort of the weakest player maybe by set aside just because he's young but in terms of the structure and balance of the team and getting McAllister into his best position are Liverpool potentially a better team with Endo even if Endo individually isn't you know sort of on the level of some of the other players I can see that to a point, but I think the key difference here is that we were talking about Fabinho and Henderson playing centre-back, and therefore they couldn't play in midfield, mm. and so Liverpool were weak in midfield as well, and only when Williams and, and Phillips came in were they allowed to go back and, and play in the normal position. I think the difference here is that Liverpool are not desperately crying out for McAllister to play further forward because they've got the other three options that can mm. do that. They've got Harvey Elliott as well. They've got, they've got loads of options who can play McAllister's best role. It, it's more you might get a benefit in terms of having a more natural number six but you don't get the double benefit of also then having McAllister further forward because even if you pick McAllister further forward that means you don't have Curtis Jones who I think Liverpool really missed when he was suspended um, for, for the weekend's game so it, it's not quite the same I don't think for me um, and for, for all the reasons I've just explained that I'm not I'm not convinced that Endo is a better option as a six than McAllister is there might be certain things that he's better at, but I think there's certainly more things that he's not quite as good at that would soon become exposed. Having said that, Everton next, they're not massively different in quality to, to a Leicester or a team like that. Mm. There's a run of games now where Liverpool play, I can't remember the order, but Everton, Forest, Luton, those are the teams where if you are going to try Endo in that position and you are going to yeah. put him into the team, you do it then. And if he can do it, maybe that's the, the level that he mm. can do it against. If you throw him in against Everton, it's it's a big one. But you know, maybe you put him in against Luton and you see what happens. If it doesn't work, you can swap and, and try something different. But you know, for for all of what I've said about not wanting to try it, if they are going to try it, it, I think it's it's got to be after this international break. There's a run of games now where it, it mm -hmm. makes sense as much as it ever will do to to try that and, and just see what happens. And, and not just in terms of the fixtures, but also the fact that McAllister's playing in the early hours of, of Wednesday yeah. morning next yeah. week. So he's probably going to be able to train once before the game. I mean, Endo might start anyway. So, so let's say Endo has a really good game in the derby, keeps his place in the side, and then we're getting to I think the game after that is Nottingham Forest at home. So we get to, to that game and Endo's played really well. McAllister's ready to come back into the Premier League starting 11. But Klopp wants to keep Endo in the team. I mean, if we were to put Endo in now, are we looking at a situation where McAllister would actually have a big fight on his hands, weirdly, to actually be starting ahead of Curtis yeah. Jones? Is it maybe proven to be a slight blessing in a weird way that McAllister has played deeper? Because it's not only meant that Jones can play, but it's meant you know both of them can be in the team at the same time. 
Yeah, I think obviously Jones um, will be suspended for a couple of games, so there's yeah. maybe a bit of an easier route into it there, and he can play the, the midweek games in between. But as soon as he's back, I think he's he's one of the first names on my team sheet at the moment. I don't think if it came down to we're going to play Endo, so who do you want to the left of him? Is it Jones or McAllister? Obviously, you know McAllister. We've not really had a, a chance yeah. to see in that position, but I don't see anybody being ahead of Curtis Jones in that role at the moment. I think we, we saw it loads against Brighton where Liverpool missed him in terms of just the, the quiet things that he does, being able to win the ball back, the pressing, the you know complete knowledge of, of that system. He's, he's basically played that role now for two or three years. Mm. He's been learning, you know, even when he's been injured, he's been training in that position. He's been learning that role. He's been taught how to do it. You know, McAllister doesn't have that as good a player as he is. Mm. Um, right now, for me, it would be you know, if, if McAllister doesn't play six, I don't think he plays in, in the first choice midfield for the biggest game of, of that week. And that's not a bad thing. He, he might play as an eight in, you know, a, a Carabao Cup game or, you know, a Europa League group match or whatever. But I, I don't think if McAllister, if the decision is McAllister has to move out of the number six, which wouldn't be my call. But if it was, I, I think that means he goes to the bench rather than moves further forward. Yeah, and I think one thing that, that suits McAllister really is that I think Klopp's made this point as well. His tactical intelligence, I think, it, it is quite is quite high. I think it's you know he's sort of above average for that. So I think that if it does become a thing where he is battling with Jones for that position, which would be a really interesting fight between those two, you know, I think what you say about him adjusting to the position, obviously, it would take time. But I think he could probably do that slightly quicker than yeah. um, maybe some other players could. It, it doesn't have to be one or the other as well. I mean, we've got this in the front line, haven't we? Where you can have an hour of Luis Diaz and then bring on Diogo Jota. Yeah. If you're going to have that where you have an hour of Jones and then you have half an hour of McAllister, I mean, I, I wouldn't say no to that. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of different uh, combinations that get tried over the course of the season just with the amount of games that Liverpool have and, and rotation and things like that. But yeah, we'll, we will leave it there for this episode. Thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Remember to check out all the written content that goes up on liverpool.com over the international break. We, pro- we pro- I promise we will still have a lot of interesting articles going up for you even though there aren't any games on and remember to obviously follow everything that's going up on blood red as well we'll be back next week with another edition of the podcast so yeah we will see you then